I got all these scraps of wood that I busted with my strength testing machine and I realized there's one more test I could run with these. How hard is it to split? I was going to make little test samples like this and then press on them like this with my screw jack until they split, but that didn't always work because sometimes the wood would fail by bending. So instead I made these uh, two and a half centimeter long blocks and decided to split them with a wedge from one end. And I cut a tiny little slot on the bandsaw to make sure the split started where I wanted it. I cut and polished a wedge onto the end of this threaded rod. Not all test pieces failed with a bang. Some of them, like this one, just cracked open gently. Of course, I filmed more of the ones that failed spectacular, because those are more fun to watch. I'm making it look like it proceeded fairly fast, uh, but it was actually a pretty tedious process on and off over the course of a couple of days, preparing samples and breaking more things and deciding I needed more samples and breaking more samples and so on. When the specimen breaks, the uh, jack always jumps a bit, so I finally had the idea of just clamping this piece across. It's not touching the jack, but when it jumps, it keeps it from jumping out of place. I split over a hundred of these little blocks of wood. Uh, each species I split at least two times. I added the split forces to my big spreadsheet, and here's the average of those sorted highest to lowest, and at uh, the top is dogwood, then white ash, hickory, hickory, hard maple, oak, Sweet gum, Norway maple, oak, white ash again, lilac bush, hard maple, beech, ironwood. But the split forces are not as consistent as I'd like, so I highlighted some of the ones where I have quite a bit of variability. Some of this may be natural variations in the wood, especially if I'm going parallel to the grain or perpendicular to it. So I always made sure I had one of each. And if the grain wasn't parallel to the edge of the wood, then I just kind of tried to alternate this way and that way just to make sure I'd average these things out. But then there are other inconsistencies. So uh, this red oak sample was consistent with itself at 217 and this other red oak sample down here averaged 137. Going back to my samples, uh, these were the hard to split ones and these were the easy to split ones. You can see the grain density is quite different between the two of them even though they're the same species. But I was also wondering, maybe I wasn't consistent enough in how deep I cut these slots to start to split. And if that wedge bottoms out in the bottom of the slot, maybe that changes things a bit. I was thinking about that when I ground that wedge on here, so I made sure it was all nice and polished and coming to a very point, so it wouldn't matter if it bottomed out. But now looking at it again, it seems like there is perhaps a bit of a flat spot right there. And examining the split on some of these blocks, you can see there is a piece that kind of was pushed down here. So that suggests the flat spot was maybe pushing against that and that would add extra splitting force. But if the slot was deep enough, then you just have the polished edge pushing against the side of it without bottoming out. And where did that flat spot come from? Did the jack actually jump high enough to bang into the steel bar? So I went back and examined some of the clips I shot of it bouncing and sure enough, it did. But was the flat spot there to begin with, or did it develop from all the bouncing? My apparatus uses this camera module to take a photo before and after each break. Of course, once it's broken, most of the time the sample is gone. So looking at some of those photos, it looks like earlier on there was not a flat spot, and later in the tests there was. I retested with hard maple, and the deep slot broke at 78, the shallow slot broke at 105, but this deep slot broke at 156. 
I suspect the maple is stronger splitting parallel to the growth rings than it is perpendicular to them. So I hadn't adequately controlled for the depth of slot that I cut and the pointiness of my wedge. But at the same time, the variations from that aren't necessarily bigger than other natural variations I saw with the wood. So what I really should do is prepare another hundred odd samples and break them all on the tester. But for some of my species samples, I'm really running out of uh, clean pieces of wood to cut these off of. Because I'm cutting these off of specimens that are broken multiple places and I don't want to be too close to the break because the wood will be damaged from that. But more importantly, I don't feel like running all those tests again. It is what it is. For making mechanisms, the split strength is often the most important strength because, for instance, this gear, the grain actually goes this way. So for any of these teeth to break off, it's essentially splitting along the grain. But going back to my spreadsheet of imperfect measurements, uh, I remember Peter Collins was saying he used black locust recently and it split a lot on him, but in terms of splitting force on my measurements, it's far from the worst. But absolute split force may not be that relevant. Maybe it's split force in relation to hardness. So I computed the split force divided by the indentation force or hardness measure and put that in a column here and sorted by that. So the ones that are hard to split but relatively soft would probably be fairly forgiving woods. And the ones I've got here is white oak, uh, red oak sample. Mind you, I've got another red oak sample way down here. Cedar, box elder, hickory, sweet gum, sycamore, hemlock. Surprisingly, because hemlock actually splits easily, but it is a relatively soft wood. And then the uh, least forgiving woods, that is woods that are very hard and split easily. So if you were to drive a nail into them, they wouldn't yield, but split instead. And the worst by that measure is Osage orange. And then one of my cherry samples, uh, lilac bush, and then black locust. So black locust is, by that measure, one of the least forgiving woods. And this is broken Osage orange and broken lilac. Yeah, not very forgiving. So if your uh, mortise is a bit of a tight fit in a tenon hole, and you just decide to compensate for it by banging it in, well, if you're using Osage orange or black locust, forget it. It's just going to split on you. Also interesting, by forgivingness, uh, box elder, or we call it Manitoba maple, I always think of it as kind of a garbage wood. It's really not much good for anything, but it does appear to be a rather forgiving wood compared to some species. And box elder, even though it's very light and soft when it's dry, it is hard to split for firewood. It's really not much good for anything. And doing some scatter plots of my data, here I've got density versus split force, and you can see it correlates a bit same with hardness, but the hardness and density actually, those correlate super well, so those are almost the same graph. Interestingly enough, the bending breaking force versus the splitting force, that correlation is rather poor. Which is kind of interesting because you think of a wood as being strong or weak, but being strong along the grain doesn't necessarily mean it's strong across the grain. And depending on what you're building, that may be a big factor. So if you're making, for instance, an end grain cutting board or even a cutting board with a fancy handle cutout, the cross grain strength is going to be a lot more important than the along the grain strength. And a bit of a surprise for me, I've always thought of ironwood as the ultimate wood for mechanism because it's just so hard and heavy. But in terms of splitting, it actually does worse than quite a lot of other woods. So for making intricate mechanisms, it may not be the best. And here's another interesting graph. From previous experiments, I plotted the uh, bending strength against the density, and you can see it correlates pretty good. But I thought maybe cross grain strength contributes to weight in the same kind of way. So this scatter plot is density versus bending strength and the cross grain splitting strength times 0.5, and that produces a pretty narrow band, essentially a much better correlation than this. So that's to say along the grain strength and cross grain strength both require more density to get more of it. And on my scatter plot, uh, there was one that was a bit more of an outlier and I examined the samples and decided that they should be retested and on retesting them, they were closer to that main correlation line. So pretty cool. All this despite my rather flawed data. But for the most part, these experiments mostly affirmed stuff that I already intuitively knew.
But I guess if you don't work with wood a lot, then it could be useful data just in terms of getting a reference on things. So I've added all this data to the spreadsheet I've got on my website from my previous tests. So it's all in one spreadsheet now, and if you want to play with it, just go ahead and download it.